Hello, everybody, and thank you, Janet Lee. That was super by the spirit music. That, it just touched us, everyone listening, I'm sure of that. And today is March 17th, 2013. We're starting a new series today called The Lost Book of the Wars of the Gods. Now, someone will probably say, hey, it's not the lost book of the wars of the gods. It's the lost book of the wars of the Lord. Uh, well, the Lord is not fighting with himself. And the Bible tells us in the sixth chapter of Ephesians and the twelfth verse, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there are principalities and powers that the war is going on with, and there are other scriptures as we get up the road with this teaching that I will show you which confirms that the real meaning is the war of the gods or the, or the war of the principalities. <clears throat> now, um, this lost book of the war of, of the gods, uh, believe me, is going to be incredible. Uh, when, we, when we read in Revelations 7, it tells us about the war that took place in heaven with Michael the archangel and his seraphim angels and Lucifer and his angels. Uh, wow. You know, they, his name was Lucifer then, but they to make it easier to understand who it's referring to, it uses the term Satan and then sometimes the devil and the dragon and all of those kind of terms that all end up referencing uh, the same entities. And so um, we're, going to, we're going to dive deep. We're going to dive deeply <coughs> into some things. It will be important that I have to repeat a few things uh, that I've covered in the past uh, just to um, uh, nourish uh, the, the coming together of, of all of the um, intricate and important, uh, you know, viable terms that, that uh, need to be connected as we keep getting further and further up the road in the awesome uh, revelation of all these things that just seem to be a book of no end. So um, uh, here we go. Uh, uh, let's just, uh, let's just, oh, something I might just toss in. You know, recently I've been doing the teaching about the rings. I talked about uh, the ring, you know, that uh, Moses wore, uh, the ring that Solomon wore, uh, the, uh, the ring that Gyges uh, in Lydia uh, or in that general area found. Uh, there was this big horse uh, in a grave that opened up from an earthquake, and it was a monument a tomb, and uh, inside that was the bones of a king, and on his bony finger was a ring that Gyges got hold of. It's called a magic ring, and uh, and the uh, the the uh, the story, the legend of Solomon uh, and his magic ring, which purportedly he probably got from um, the uh, the queen. Uh, or not the queen, but the daughter of Pharaoh, uh, who became one of Solomon's queens. And, um, and it's interesting because uh, we talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, the Trojan horse, which uh, we will get into that, which was uh, the, uh, you know, this uh, whole thing uh, ties into uh, the land of Lydia, where uh, Gyges had set up his kingdom, who was Gog. And uh, then there's, uh, uh, so the two horses, the, the Trojan horse of Troy, and uh, the horse that, uh, where the king was buried that had uh, the ring, that was the magic ring, if you want to call it that, uh, that Gyges got hold of. So that's, that's all interesting story, and there's more on that. But what I want to just make as, as an interesting thought, Google just recently announced that they are working on a project to end 
uh, needing to use passwords because there's so many people that forget their passwords, get confused and mixed up with it. Plus, it's much more susceptible uh, to to uh, being, um, you know, solved as as uh, uh, personal identity and the theft of personal identity. Uh, and so their idea that they have come up with is called a magic ring. And this is something you would actually perhaps wear on your finger and you could plug it into your computer. There'd be a spot there where you just plug it in and it's your own identification ring. No one else would have anything with that kind of a print uh, just like it. And so they could not open uh, into your uh, personal things on the computer. And I just think it's so interesting how all these uh, you know, issues of information are coming up right now as we go along with the, the teaching uh, of uh, these uh, outstanding revelations. Now, um, uh, let's, just, uh, let's just look at, at some things here that uh, are going to, uh, to prove uh, how incredible that the Bible is. You know, when we look at Psalms 139, <clears throat> 17 through 18, it says, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Now, it's very interesting to look at this in a certain way, that there are thoughts, and these thoughts have expressions, and these expressions tell us uh, revelation, tell us prophecy, speak of love, uh, speak of exhortations, and uh, that they are precious, but in addition to that, there is a sum that they have. In other words, there's an addition involved that can be understood. They, they can add up to having a meaning. So then it goes on, <clears throat> and it says, if I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. This knowledge has something to do about eternalness. It has something to do about going through the sleep and coming out of the sleep and then being in the arms of Jesus Christ, in the arms of the everlasting God. And it, it is nothing less than, uh, you know, uh, the, the beauty of God's word. Because here when he mentions, if I should count them, because he's just... Uh, brought out the idea how great is the sum of the of the thoughts. Then he says, if if I should count them, they're more in number than the sand of the sea. Of course, uh, our seas or oceans. So, if you can imagine that, uh, this just isn't words. Sometimes people want to make it words. Like I know there uh, is the geometric uh, concept with Kabbalah and and even modern day people into geometrics. And I'm not knocking anyone that's into that, but this is where uh, individual uh, 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 words, or even a collection of individual words, uh, can have uh, a connection uh, uh, by taking the, the number of the uh, alphabet of the Hebrew and of the Greek, and uh, you know, using it to interpret by the number value of the words. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, I am that I am in the book of Exodus. If you took all of the number of each one of those words, uh, it would come to 543. And, uh, and then if you took 543 and added it horizontally by, by number value, uh, you would have 12 which would be a really, really important number that's used all throughout the Bible. And, um, and Enoch walked uh, would be 555. Uh, the key would be 528. Uh, Israel would be 541. Those would be the values of those particular numbers. Now, there's a lot of people into all of that. Uh, that's not something that you know we're, uh, we're talking on right now. Uh, but uh, even the word alphabet, uh, could, it would be 523 uh, and value, and the and the and uh, you know the the key, as I said, would be 528. There's uh, another uh, 
possibility of, of that reference of the key is uh, in 538, which is 10 more digits. So there's all kinds of things, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge as a signet, and that's very important because signet is on a ring. Uh, the, the number value of that would be um, 474. So that's, that's just... That's just totally interesting, uh, you know, and a lot of people, like I say, there's uh, people that are into that, and uh, I am just going on with what I'm doing. I've got a lot to cover. Maybe someday we'll, we'll talk on that subject more. Um, I wrote a little note here. It says, those persons made fit of willingness. There's a, a way a person could be made fit because you are so willing. It is your will for something to happen. It is your will uh, to believe in, the th in, in certain thoughts or expressions or prophecies or revelation that God has spoken. And, uh, and those people who, who, who are made fit by willingness, uh, their minds are the kind of minds that can be uh, part of the new spiritual exploration that is uh, happening and, and of the things being revealed of the, of the Holy Manifest. So we certainly do welcome all the people in. Just want to um, uh, just go over a couple little fast uh, things here about the word world that we find uh, in the New Testament especially. And uh, because it's very, very important as I get out, as I expand uh, this teaching uh, to what the world means, and and we begin to understand that we are not just limited, uh, you know, to to uh, the, the terra forma, the, to the just the the, the earth, uh, little planet, little speck of dust. That there is a whole lot more uh, than than that uh, to to be understood and calibrated, and uh, we we get into uh, uh, you know. Um, uh, Matthew twenty six thirteen, the message of salvation shall be preached in the whole world, and the word for world there is cosmos. So we're talking universal. Uh, this is Bible. This is Bible. You, you, if you know, if there's people out there that's not going to want to accept that that that, that the Bible, uh, you know, the uh, says world, and that the world comes in the Greek from the word cosmos, which means the universe. They just don't want to accept that sometimes. But that doesn't mean that that's where you have to be. If you are in the willingness of your heart and of your mind uh, and of your intentions to really know the Word of God, and you stick with this manifest revelation that's coming forth. Uh, uh, you are going to be so far ahead of these other people who have stuck with the old, worn-out concepts that that don't even uh, give conclusions to anything. So the Bible says, you know, laying aside the principles of the foundations of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And someone would say, "Hey, you're 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 putting these some of these doctrines of Jesus Christ aside, and you're emphasizing these other things. Is that right?" Well, I wonder what the Bible means when it says that. Laying aside the principles of the foundations of the doctrines of Jesus Christ, let us go on to perfection. So then there are certain aspects of a sum of the doctrines of Jesus Christ which are beautiful, which are wonderful, which are true, but they do not add to the total sum of all the thoughts that give you the number of perfection. And so you have to collectively add as an addendum these other thoughts, these other revelations, this other knowledge, so that you can have a total sum of the wholeness of what God is speaking and what God is saying. And so when the Bible says in Matthew twenty six thirteen, the message of salvation shall be preached in the whole cosmos, in the whole universe, I believe that. I believe that that's what's going to happen. So when I do this teaching on, on the element of time and the mystery of the time, and I, I show, you know, the, the, this incredible revelation of 70 to 80,000, uh, you know, <laughs> years of time, which are, which are, are, are speaking of generations, uh, you know, which is, you know, in the 105th chapter of, of Psalms and, and, uh, and connects to several other kinds of scriptures I've taught you in the past. I'm, I'm saying these things because, you know, we're going to be talking about a whole universe. 
and, and that isn't going to happen today. That isn't going to happen tomorrow. And so these people who have been preaching in Matthew 24 uh, that, that, you know, the end of the world is just about here. Jesus is just about to come. They don't know the Bible. They don't know what they're talking about. And so you've got all these preachers, uh, many of them, not all of them, I shouldn't say all, but a great majority, a great number of preachers, ministers, priests, that are making predictions, and one after another, they just continuously start falling and failing. But I'm going to tell you that time is going on, and, and yes, Jesus is coming again. He's, he's always coming, and he's always going away. And, and uh, you know, if Jesus is really in your heart, you already have Jesus, and, and, and so don't get so shook up about his coming because he's already come into your heart, you know? And, and uh, the human body, you know, it, it's just a, a time capsule. It only lasts so long, and then you either have to get a new body or, or, or something else has to happen. So, so when the, the scripture goes on, it says, uh, you know, as I, as I showed you, the message shall be preached in the whole universe. Uh, when it says in John three sixteen, for God so loved the cosmos, God so loved the world, that actually is, is, is cosmos from the Greek. God so loved the universe. Uh, and, and John 4, 42, Christ is the savior of the universe. Um, uh, John seventeen eleven. Uh, you know, uh, I speak uh, not of of um, of uh, universal things. I speak of spiritual things. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just so wonderful that he tells us when you know he's wanting to talk about the universe, and then he tells us when no, that's not the subject right now. Now I'm talking to you about the spiritual things. So I hope that uh, you really are catching on to this and plugging that in because it is so important, you know. Uh, now, the earth is not the whole world. Uh, it is only a small fraction of the world, but it is a part of the world or a part of the universe. So sometimes when it speaks of the earth, it's speaking of the earth as it is a part of that part which is a part of the cosmos or the universe. And, uh, and, and you know, when we talk about the end of the world, uh, verse 165 actually means, uh, you know, forever. And, and someone says, forever, well, that's without end. No, that's not without end. That's why the Bible tells us there's a forever and an ever. So <clears throat> you can't have a forever and an ever if the one forever is the end. And, and you know, you've got a forever and an ever uh, because two forevers equal one eternity. So um, we gotta, let's just move on. <clears throat> so the Book of the Wars uh, is mentioned in the Book of, of Numbers, and we'll we'll just read that to you right now, Numbers uh, twenty one fourteen, and just give you a chance to uh, to hear this title because we always like to give scriptural backing because uh, where are we without uh, without scriptural backing? Well, we're nowhere. So uh, Numbers twenty one fourteen, uh, you know, here is what it says: Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea. And in the brooks of Arnon. And, you know, we're going to be talking about all of those things. Plus a whole bunch of other things that are all part of the, of the uh, Book of the Wars. And we're going to be revealing that. But this particular message today is sort of going to be introductory. And it's going to be very, very interesting. It'll be introductory uh, to the Book of the Wars of the Gods. And uh, this Book of the Wars of the Lord is actually also meaning the Book of the Wars of the, of the Gods. And I'll continuously, or often anyway, give you scriptures to, to back that all up. So... Um, <clears throat> As I said, we also had Revelations 12, 7, mentions about Michael uh, fighting against the dragon. Uh, we've got uh, the scriptures I just showed you, you go into all the universe. Um, wow, we, we, there is so much. It is so, so beautiful. Uh, Revelations nineteen nineteen talks about the beast and the kings gathering to make war against the white horse rider. Uh, Revelation 17, 12 through 14 talks about the horns uh, and the lamb and, and war, at, at war. Uh, Revelation 11, 7 talks about the, the beast descends from the pit and, uh, and kills the witnesses, uh, which it describes in Revelation 9 also. So, wow, uh, those things are absolutely, absolutely awesome. Um, 
we find sometimes that the that there's lots of wars, but the word war can become very uh, specific. Uh, you know, for instance, in uh, Revelations uh, uh, twenty and eight, it talks about the war, which is the definite article. So it it specializes it and it limits it by uh, being a definite article, the war. And and uh, like what it talks about in Revelations uh, 16, 14, uh, you know, the battle or the war of the great day of God Almighty, the war of the angels, the war. Uh, that's important to understand, uh, uh, you know, those those references. Now, <clears throat> I'm just beginning to do this, but I'm going, to, I'm going to increase this. I'll try to go through this fairly fast. But I just want to show you there are words that are in the Bible that a lot of people are not just very uh, aware of. But Zeus, uh, Z-E-U-S or Z-E-U-S, uh, you know, is, is a term that uh, can be found uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, look if, in your Greek concordance under uh, the tw uh, number 2203. And, uh, and what that actually means is among the Latins, uh, it was speaking of Jupiter or Jove, J-O-V-E. And I think a lot of times that people looked at the word Jove and thought that that was abbreviation for J Jehovah. But, you know, it actually was Jove, uh, the supreme deity of the Greeks, Jupiter. And uh, then there's uh, Zenos, uh, uh, Z-E-N-O-A-S, a poetic form, uh, you know, of, of this word uh, Zeus. Uh, <clears throat> there's the word dragon, D-R-A-K-O-N, uh, describing uh, in the Greek concordance 1404 a fabulous kind of serpent or dragon. Uh, these are just things that, you know, they're in the Bible. Uh, there's uh, Ab Abaddon, uh, number three in the Greek, a destroying angel. And then there's Alpha, uh, you know, which is the first letter of the alphabet, and it's also used as a numeral uh, in its uh, content. So, when we look at that and we see that alpha equals number one, then we see that which, uh, when it refers to the, uh, God being the alpha and the omega, that God's number is one, and we are the zeros. So we have no value of any kind as a zero placed alone. But the minute a one or one of God's fractional numbers are put in front of it, then our zeros have value. And uh, and those things are just you know, so uh, so so important. Um, then there's um, uh, oh so so many other uh, you know uh, Angelus or uh, uh, Agelus, um, uh, uh, you know which uh, means messenger angel. Um, wow. And then when we were talking about Melchizedek without mother or father. Uh, you know, a number 35 in the Greek of the concordance, Strong's concordance, uh, it mentions him as unregistered to birth. With And so when it says without descent, people think that well, he never did ever have a father or, or, um, uh, or a mother. But no, what the really word translation of it is, is that he's unregistered to, uh, to birth on earth. That's because he was not born on earth. Uh, he was born at the father's house, and uh, he was—he's an offspring of Enoch. And uh, then there's the word uh, in uh, uh, number thirty-nine, Hagion, uh, H-A-G-I-O-N, uh, which means a sacred thing, the holiest of all, a holy place, a sanctuary. Uh, Hagius. Number 40 means holy one, saint, and can even mean angels. So sometimes there are words that are sort of secretly hidden and interwoven. Uh, it, could, it could be an interpretation of the word, uh, uh, you know, hagios, and, uh, and actually mean holy ones or mean angels, and people would be, would be missing it. So those are just a few points that are, you know, really, really uh, important. Now... <clears throat> People say, you know, how are you going to do this thing on the, on the, uh, 
you know, revitalization of the lost book. I mean, no one's found the lost book of the wars, uh, you know, lost book of, of the war of the angels or of the gods. Uh, how are you going to do that? Well, we've been teaching you in Hebrew, uh, in Hebrew, the concordance of Strong's 268. It talks about uh, Akava. And Akava means solution of the riddles. And it was written in Chaldean. And so that's where we're coming from by using the solution of the riddles to take the fragments that exist in the Bible, even some of the runes that, that remain. And we call them runes because of how that they were treated in translation. Uh, we are able to still take those runes and those fragments and, and, and bring the solution to the riddle of that lost book. And we'll be doing that over a period of time. Uh, there is this word, a beautiful word, called mem memoir. Uh, M E M W A H, memoir. And I love that word. And uh, it's about, you know, memory. I especially like to use it in conjunction with the theme and the idea of being able to restore lost memory. That there is a memoir that, that lives uh, in the soundtron. And the soundtron lives in every atom, in every molecule, uh, in, in every. Uh, particle and piece of a particle, even a fragment, you know, and if you take the, the message that's in the fragment, it brings you back to the particle, and you take the message in the particle, it brings you back to the various groupings uh, that it is in, where it makes up everything from from grass to snow to human beings, and 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 the stories of of the ten words, the these uh, incredible words that have been misunderstood and, and called the ten commandments, but they are something much greater uh, than that because they are collective and so there are groups of them and if we can know the sum of them the sum of them it's absolutely incredible and if we count the number of them by understanding this the solution to the riddles we suddenly open the invisible bible of which the bible says that there are those people who have eyes to see but they see not have ears to hear but they hear not so as we open this invisible bible of these lost words and we find these these uh, descriptive things in the bible the whole story that was in people's minds lost is really not lost. Now keep in mind, I read this to you ever so often. Um, when we look at the, at the old Hebrew, uh, at the old Hebrew testimony, or pardon me, testament, uh, it has only 6,000 words. And uh, they are all derived from about 500 roots. Consequently, only 500 roots means that the, that a same word can have a great variety of meaning. So you can have a word, and all right, so the translators can take and translate that word because the root has, you know, maybe, maybe uh, three, four, five, maybe dozens uh, of, of uh, uh, derivatives that can be taken from that word. And so, you know, uh, uh, you can't exactly come back to someone uh, who has done a different version of a Bible or has come up with a, a particular um, uh, a translation or a particular interpretation and say to him, you're wrong, you're absolutely wrong. Uh, uh, they may not be wrong as far as the, the uh, potential uh, to take that word and take one of its root derivatives because, you know, there is such a variety that can be there. But where you really come into it, you know, is what is the language of the Bible and what is the context. So when, when something is in context, that makes all the difference in the world. But then you still have, you know, uh, these special things like the word and, and the word and is a very special word, uh, and um, we'll, you know, we've talked about that in the past, we'll talk about that more in the future, but, but it can mean, it can mean that it, it, uh, it, is, uh, it is speaking of a part that is not right there in the scripture, but that is, a, it belongs and associates to the meaning and is a part of it 
even though it's not right there in the context. And and uh, so we've we've taught on that before. That is that is has Bible for it. That's not our subject today. But anyway, you know, understanding that 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 there's only 500 roots, and and those 500 roots can have a huge variety of meaning, and 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 uh, also understand that Hebrew identifies with the Phoenician language, uh, uh, and and uh, that was proven by interpretation of the Semitic languages on the the uh, Mob- Mobite stone. Okay, so, <clears throat> interesting. A tremendous discovery was made in south-central China near the Changsha, Hunan province in a small village called Mawang. Now, <clears throat> this is very important. What was that discovery? Well, in an ancient complex of funeral caves of the form, former prime minister of Shangsha, C-H-A-N-G-S-H-A, dating from the Han, H-A-N, dynasty, 207, B, uh, 207 B.C.E., the minister's son, relative to that, was buried April 4th, 168 B.C. Now, the tomb that they found there in this discovery at the said village and the said province yielded 51, 51 items, most of which were books, or texts written on silk, and also maps and charts and diagrams. Many of the texts were found of which modern times had no previous knowledge. They didn't even know such texts existed. The oldest version version of a great classic such as the I Ching book, I Ching, C-H-I-N-G book, which is a famous book, and it means the Book of Changes was found. Four classics of the Yellow Emperor was found. There were also profound astronomy texts. And one of the texts dealt with a a certain comet. Now, Carl Sagan, S-A-G-A-R-A-N, Carl Sagan, a renowned American astronomer, was amazed at this text which depicted drawings in an atlas, now I want you to get this, of a comet, the shape of a swastika, S-W-A-S-T-I-K-A, swastika, S-W-A-S-T-I-K-A. Now, most people would remember the swastika as being the emblem on the the, uh, Hitler's um, uh, shoulder pads of his uh, soldiers, and uh, and of the of the German flag. And someone might say, "Well, now what does the swastika and all this stuff have to do with the battle, of the wars of the Lord?" Well, hang and hold. You're going to be amazed, and you're going to be surprised at what this all does have. But here's a comet that buzzed across the heavens. That was the shape, if you can imagine, of a swastika. The two arms. Wow. Well, you're going to find this subject on the swastika very, very important. And you're going to be, you know, be, be enlightened here today when we get into this subject. We, you know, here just a few weeks ago, we re- revealed this thing that it's been out, you know, talked about since 1980, but, but it's really become prevalent in, in the 2000s because they, they sent a new craft there and got a really good close-up of this hexagon that's on the north pole of, of, of Saturn. And, and, and the meaning of what hexagon uh, meant with this six points. And 
I've explained that to you and I preached that to you. I can't, I'm not going to preach it again. I don't have time. And then the, 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 the vortex, another vortex, that was one vortex, another vortex on the south pole of an eye. And we've been into all of those things. They're very interesting. And now we have another mystery, a comet, the shape of a swastika. Now, what could the possible connection be? Well, there's a famous archaeologist, Dr. Schleisman. Dr. Schleisman found, found swastikas in his excavation at the site of ancient Troy. Now, Troy, remember the Trojan horse that was brought into this invincible-type city that the Greeks made, but they hid soldiers inside of it? And then when everyone was asleep, the soldiers came out of this huge Trojan horse and opened the gate so the armies of the Greeks could come in and defeat the Trojans. Well, they, this Dr. Schweitzleman, S-C-H-L-I-E-M-A-N-N, found all these swastikas. Well, guess where Troy is? Well, Troy is in the the Lydia, I mean, this is the area, Lydia, the Lydia area, where Gyges, who is Gog, had a kingdomship. There were seven kings, all relatives, all offspring of Gyges. And that's where Troy was. And, and people said, hey, Troy's just a legend. It, uh, it's not real. It doesn't exist. It's just a legend. Well, there's a lot of people saying things like that about things in the Bible. Well, that's not real. That doesn't have any potency of, of reality. And they don't know what they're talking about. And oh, what a blessing it would be if they, when they didn't know, if they would just keep quiet. But Troy, the Troy story and legend of the Trojan horse happened right in in Lydia. Whoa. Now, some people say the swastika can can resemble a wheel, because if you take all the ends of the of the arms and, and you drew a circle around it, you would, you know, it'd be like a circle. That's interesting. Supposedly, when Hitler was involved with his swastika, it was representing the sun. You know, like the power of the sun, the light of the sun. Wow. Some people say, yeah, even represents the four corners of the earth, called the mystic cross. Well, that's an idea. The swastika is over 14,000 years old. And this thing in, in Lydia, where they found these swastikas, and it dates back to 3,000 years old, those, those swastikas. We're going to take a break. We've got Janet on the organ for five minutes. I'll be back.
All right. Again, thank you, Janet Lee. And so, the swastika. Someone will say, well, hey, hey, wait a minute. The swastika is not in the Bible. Well, actually, yes, it is. And we're going to reveal these things because we're talking about the Bible. And it's so vast that I won't be able to give you all the scriptures in this one teaching. But little by little, as we go on into this incredible uh, new um, series of teachings on the lost book of the wars of the gods, you are going to be elevated in knowledge. Okay, so over 3,000 years ago then, there was this find and, uh, and by this famous archaeologist in uh, the area of Lydia, uh, and, and <laughs> they found these, this ancient burial mass made out of all gold, and on it was the swastika. Now, this goes way, way back. In fact, we, we mentioned that, historically speaking, it goes back 14,000 years. Why would something be so, so popular? Uh, why, why, would it, why would it have such a, a demand of use? Well, you know, the swastika was considered good luck, a blessing, joy, a, a sign of, a symbol of blessing or joy or happiness, a wish of peace. That is until Hitler used it and revealed another side to the meaning of this word swastika. What a person needs to understand is how extensive that this thing of the, of the swastika is. Now, for instance, Homer accounts on the story of, of Troy and this whole thing of, of the swastika. But the dispersion of the swastika is all over the world. Japan, Korea, China, Tibet, India. Babylonian, Assyrian, Chal uh, Chaldean, Persia, uh, Phoenicia, Lyconia, Armenia, Caucasus, Asia Minor, the Mediterranean, Greece, Cyprus, Rhodes, Milos, Thera, Europe, Italy, Germany, Austri Austria, Belgium, Scandinavia, Scotland, Ireland, Gallo, Roman period, France, Britain, on and on and on. Well, what is it? Well, it's, it's a symbol of a cross. It's, it's a cross. The swastika is a cross. Now, there are all kinds, if you go back in history, of churches that have taken and put up different designs of the cross uh, with a slightly different flavor to it than the cross that many people are used to seeing, which is more like a T. But, you know, the actual shape and form of the cross is controversial. Some people say it was just a pole with a settee on it. Well, we're going to get into all of that. And it's going to be very interesting. But there are all kinds of comparatives to this thing of the, of the cross and the different significance of this swastika to the four winds, to the dragonflies, to the caduceus. Now hold on, we'll be explaining all this to you. The swastika is the earliest known symbol. There is no other symbol that's ever been given that knowingly that it dates back 
as anciently as the swastika. It has been around and it's been all over the world in every religion, practically. And if you want to know what the history of the cross is, you need to know about the swastika. It is the most ancient of the crosses. The earliest known symbol and the most ancient of the crosses. And the name swastika is a Sanskrit name. Wow. It is said that the swastika, the swastika must have been in existence long before even the Buddhist religion or the Sanskrit language. So even though people say, well, it must be from the Sanskrit, Sanskrit language, the dates don't make relevance because it just goes back. Yes, it used to be thought that the swastika was for, for goodwill um, to, to, to be or keep on being and all those kinds of things. <coughs> But the swastika anciently has been an emblem of Zeus, Z-E-U-S, Baal, B-A-A-L, of the sun. Its appearance on the person of Astari and other gods <coughs> is of old and very ancientness. It also represents Fork lightning. Interesting, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. The cross. Jesus on the cross. In John 3, 14, it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I've taught on this before. How that this whole thing of in Numbers 21 about the pole with the serpent and the seraph, which was an angel of God, that was the true depiction of this, this cross that, that Moses made for healing. And it showed the seraph angel with the wings at the top, opened up with his foot standing on top of the head of the serpent, a fulfillment of a scripture in Genesis. But then they started worshiping that caduceus, that serpent and seraph pole. Seraph comes from the word seraph, seraphim, angel. And you can check that with the word seraph in Numbers to Strong's Hebrew 8314, and you'll see that the word seraph there means seraphim, which are angels. And they've got it so that the caltuses is the same as the medical caltuses. Two serpents being wrapped around the pole from opposite directions and at the tops, at the top there are two heads facing each other and above them wings on this pole. That is not the revelation that Moses had of the Caduceus. But it's been distorted because it was destroyed and that was lost and then it just ended up with, this, with the seraph, the angel being uh, taken out of the picture, only its wings left. And then people just speculated what those wings might mean or belong to and, and did not give it to the credit of it being a divine thing. And you got two serpents. And so then when they look at the scripture, they say, well, Jesus is going to be lifted up like a snake. So he would be a snake on the cross. Jesus would be lifted up like a snake on the cross. And that's the very thing that people say against Jesus, that don't, that don't believe in him. So sad. So sad that anybody would ever not understand this knowledge. 
Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. How great the power of that cross. The swastika is a, is, is a cross. It's older than the cross that Jesus hung on. But it incorporates the same idea because it is a, a cross, just like there are many different kinds of crosses. So the cross is a big thing in the Bible. And you can read about that cross in Numbers 21, 8 through 9 that was made by Moses. Or 2 Kings 18, 4. Wow. The swastika is a cross on a flagpole. So we got the pole. We have the swastika on a, 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 in Germany of Hitler on a flagpole. Wow. In Matthew 10, 38, it says, And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross. There's a revelation about the cross. And the Bible says if you don't take the cross... Someone says, well, I, I don't even know. I mean, I, can, I, I can't you know, be on the cross that Jesus was on. And he did that for me. And I don't know how, you know. Hey, this thing of the cross is a worldwide thing. It's in every nation and almost every religion. Many different kinds of organizations are big into it, like the Masons. And many other kinds of religious groups. And it's been used commercially in many different ways, going way, way back in time. Whosoever that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. This cross is something that you're not expecting you to drag it and follow Jesus. It's something that you ha have to have the knowledge of in the mind. Whoever doesn't take that cross doesn't understand the cross and follow Jesus. I'm not talking about you dragging a big, heavy, wooden pole cross and following Jesus. He's talking about having this knowledge. And then if you don't get into this knowledge, well, then as important as the cross is, you're not even worthy of Jesus Christ, it says. That's Matthew 10, 34, 38. Matthew 10, 38. I didn't write that. That was written by the Bible. Matthew 16, 24. Any man, meaning any person, that will follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There it is again. you got to take up this cross. You need to know about the cross. Now there, there are so many interesting things to cover. It's just absolutely amazing. But let me, uh, let me just go here real fast to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, and read that. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinance, for to make in himself twain one new man, so making peace. Now, the scripture talks about the law being nailed to the cross. And here we see that the cross is so important because it was used to abolish in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one. Twain means two. Son of man, son of God. And we're going to get into an understanding here just a little bit of the of and we preached on this before of the of the incredible oracle meanings of two, and and it's really important to have that down. Really important. The Bible in Philippians three eighteen speaks of the enemies of the cross. Now when you start getting to the enemies of the cross, you get into war language. The enemy, the, 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 the principalities of darkness, the enemy, they're enemies of the cross because they've got their own interpretation of the cross and it's more along the line of what Hitler did. It has a darkness to it. 
a dark principality aspect. Let's look at Ephesians 6.14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You're preparing for a war, but it's a spiritual war. And that's something that people have absolutely got to know. Wow. Wow. Now listen to this in Matthew 10, 26. Fear them not, referring to Beelzebub. Therefore, for there is nothing, N-O-T-H-I-N-G, covered that shall be revealed, that shall not be revealed. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. Now, any of you people that want to say, hey, that's not possible, that's not of the Bible, you can't restore that lost book, it's lost. Oh, really? What about the Dead Sea Scrolls? What about even during the time of the Bible when, when even the book of, of, of the Torah was to, uh, misplaced and then it was found by the righteous searching of a person? I believe the Bible when it says there is nothing covered. Someone says, hey, that lost book of the, of the wars of the Lord, that, it, that that's that's covered with dirt. That's buried. Well, it says there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Nothing. That has to include the lost book of the wars of the Lord or of the gods. There is nothing that shall not be revealed and nothing that is hid that shall not be known. Wow. Well, the caduceus. As I said, the swastika is over 14,000 years old. That goes back before Moses. It also was a symbol in ancient Troy and Mycenae. It stood for crossed lightning, bolts that were symbolizing a source of great power, Hitler used the swastika as a symbol of the power of a whirling sun. When you look straight down on the Caldusis and its two serpents as they depict it on the dark side of the meaning, guess what? It reminds you of the two swastikas. Now, if the ends of the swastika comes out on the left side, it represents female. If it comes out on the right side, it represents male. Now we have the caduceus, the, the medical caduceus, which shows these two snakes coming in from opposite directions with their head together and the wings over it. They're on a rod. And they're using this to represent you know, the hypocritical oath of the, those taking the med medical pledge. And, and, and it's a pole, it's a rod. It's the medical snake or serpent of healing, symbol known as caduceus. But there is a connection in the truth of it to the seraphim. And Moses, by Scripture, unfolding and revealing such Scriptures as Isaiah 14, 28 through 29, and Isaiah 6, 1 through 7, and Numbers 21, 6 through 9. Next week I'll go into some of that. I don't have time today. Wow. Wow. It's in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, because the caduceus is in the Bible, and that is, is another kind of cross. It's on the pole. It's got the, the wings across the top that make it like a T-pole. But the difference is, 
is we've been deprived of, we've been robbed of the real revelation that the seraph was an angel and the wings belonged to that seraph in depiction and symbolicity. And it was standing on the head of that other entity, which was a serpent. And by showing that before these snakes and serpents out on the ground when the children of Israel were trying to cross and they were being bitten and some people killed. It stopped that. It was a war and it stopped that. That's actually that whole story there is part of the war. Part of the wars of the Lord. Of the lost book. That's just one of them. And we'll get into, more, into that more. But that's been taken away. That's been, that's been robbed from the people. And they're out there believing this inverted story that makes the serpents powerful and, and entities of healing instead of the seraph, the angel of God, being the entity of healing. And when the Bible says, I will be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent. Well, as Moses lifted up the serpent... He lifted it up, being defeated by the angel being above with the wings and his foot on the head of the serpent. And when you see that, you see the power of the cross. But when you see the other caduceus, you see the power of Hitler. Well, we get into this thing of the double image. I read that one scripture to you about the twain which Jesus is in. And I did this teaching. And we can go all the way back to Exodus 26, 9, the 11 curtains of the tabernacle uh, uh, covering and, and, and coupled uh, five curtains uh, by themselves and every sixth curtain by themselves and doubled the sixth curtain in the forefront of the tabernacle, the doubling. Exodus 39, Eight through nine. The breastplate in the four square uh, doubled two ends of the breastplate. Two rings. Second Kings two nine, Elias requests a double portion of the of Elijah's spirit. Job, God is willing to show the secrets of wisdom that they are double to that which is. Isaiah forty. 2, 5, and 8. Now, if I didn't quote that scripture, Job eleven six, And now we're Isaiah 40, 2, 5, and 6. The glory of the Lord to be revealed. The word of God to stand forever. Isaiah 61, 7. For your shame and confusion, you shall have double everlasting joy. Double. Genesis 41, 32. The dream is doubled for emphasis. Exodus twenty eight sixteen. The breastplate made doubled. Wow. And that verified again in Exodus 39, 9. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. God is moving by his spirit to show us these things. Even like the double image that is, that is described of the two camps of angels. Genesis 32, 1 through 2, called the Mehaneum, Mehaneum, the the, uh, Me or Mahaneum. The Mahaneum, M-A-H-A-N-A-I-M, M-A-H-A-N-A-I-M, Mahaneum. Even when it was talking about the seraphim in Isaiah 6, 2, with twain they covered their faces. This double keeps coming up. There is a human duality that is, that is often hard to accept as the physical duality of wave and particle. It can be a dizzy type of, of employment of the mind to try to follow the swing of these philosophical and, and spiritual type of of examples. Sometimes they might seem to be contradictory because it's difficult to to ply the the spiritual in a laminate with the physical. 
But there's some quotes of great men, one that said, we are, I know not how, double in ourselves, so that what we believe we disbelieve and cannot rid ourselves of what we condemn. It is an unnerving, it is as unnerving as this duality may be. However, it may also be the essence of our survival. Wow. Dual locations, D-U-A-L, locations. The latest type of science, not just real late, but fairly late, about atomic entanglement, the ability to be in more than one place at one time. Like John 3.11 through 12, I have told you earthly things and you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which, or who, is in heaven. So he was both on earth and in, and, uh, and in heaven at the t- same time. Check out other scriptures that go along with that. Matthew 16, 9 and Matthew 18, 18 through 19. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Wow. The Bible speaks in Psalms 54 through 5 about to call on the heavens above, the earth below. You have this duality. It, it goes on and on throughout the whole Bible. I'm only bringing you a small portion of it. Just a small portion of it. We think that we have the whole of everything. And we think we know the sheepfold. And then John in, in the book of John 10, 16, Jesus suddenly reveals, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. There's always a doubling. There's always the physical city that Abraham was sent to look for. But in Hebrews 18, 8 through 16, it describes that there was a city not made with hands that he was also looking for. We have this understanding of the of the kings and the queens, which is which is hidden by using the word priests. We have kings, and then we have, you know, you, you shall be you shall be uh, called kings and priests. But actually, the priest represents the church. The church represents the woman. The woman represents the queen. Check out Revelations one six, Psalms forty five nine. Wow. So this extra entanglement we were talking about refers to connections between separated particles that persist regardless of the distance. Distance has no factor. And without collapsing the wave particle function of either separated particle, there is an interconnecting medium that makes entanglement possible. Wow. Then we have the explanation of the cherubim over the mercy seat. We've got two cherubim, one on each side. We had two cherubim at the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were shuttled out of the garden. And these two cherubim with flaming swords turning every which direction. Every which direction. So that we know that in that it was like the same thing of the meaning of the tree of life versus the tree of good and evil. That the tree of good and evil had two aspects in it. It was a one and a two. It was good, one, two, evil. But the tree of life was an alpha, a number one only. But we have to understand that we are down here in this Tartaru, in this physical world. And so this doubling comes up. We have to understand that on the cross. We have to understand that with these two cherubims, that they represent two different sides because you have the good cherubim, which are those under Gabriel, and you have we call it the bad cherubims, which are those under the cherubim angel Lucifer, Satan, who were his angels. 
So you've got represented there the curse and the blessing, the bad and the good. So to speak, the angel on the left shoulder and the angel on the right shoulder. So, as to these runes and R-U-I-N-S and fragments that we're going to revive, we cannot throw out another interesting symbolicy that we will get into, and I'll just sort of touch on it today, are the two pillars that Solomon built at the temple site. And he named them Boaz and Jachin. B-O-A-Z and J-A-C-H-I-N. Pillars at the entrance of the temple area. Boaz was the left-handed pillar. Jachin was the right-handed pillar. They've interpreted Boaz in 1 Kings 7 1. Bo to mean to be in, and Oz to mean might, strength, majesty. Jachin, the right handed pillar, also in 1 Kings 7 1, he shall establish. Someone said, well, how can that possibly have anything to do with, with this whole teaching and message? Well, it's very important connection. And it does. Boaz. Well, Boaz, if you look in the book of Ruth, turned out to be the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. And if you really get into the scripture, in Revelations 22, where Jesus said, I have sent my angels into the churches to teach them, to tell them that I am the root and the offspring of David. So when we have this bell, uh, the, the, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, pillar, the left-handed pillar, Boaz, we are incorporating the kingship. Now it's interesting, again, we have the double. And then on the other one of the Jachin, that is very, very interesting also because on that we have the priesthood. And we can verify that there was a line of priests in Jerem, uh, pardon me, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah 11.10, it mentions a, a, a different Jachin. Well, we can't say a different because we're just talking a, a pillar. But he's listed as a priest. And then if we take the priest thing and understand that that represents the church and the church represents the woman, then we end up with a queen. So we have the two pillars representing king and queen, or kings and queens. Then we understand that that is not a lot different than the meaning of the two cherubims over the Ark of the Covenant of, this, of the mercy seat, of the two flaming swords going every which way, meaning every which way has to incorporate both the good and the bad, Meaning double entity that there are times that in the woman as well as in the kingship there comes forth both the good and the evil from that book of knowledge. But nevertheless, there is revelation here, and Jesus is going to use this to the end of time because it's one of the last things he says in the book of Revelations 22. 
And he said, tell this to the churches. I am the root and the offspring. The root and the offspring. I started it and I came after it. Of David. So then we have this connection to the Boaz. Now there's much more mystery than this. But this ties us back into the revelation of the importance of the pillars. Wow. So, as we, as we really begin to open our mind <coughs> and see these connections, it is nothing less than beautiful and awesome. It's absolutely exciting. How are we to know about this word? Well, in Psalms 119.89, it says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So, the things that seem to not be settled, the things that seem to not be known, the things that seem to be hidden or lost, there's a settlement of all those things. Because as I read you the scripture early, that there is nothing that shall be lost and not revealed. Nothing. And the riddle is going to be solved. As it says in Psalms 119.89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And the scripture says in the book of Revelation, you shall be kings and queens. Kings and, and queens. And so it says, He who overcomes... Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? Revelations 3.12. So this thing of the pillar ties in to everything. And the pillar can be like the tree pole of the cross. And the decorations at the top has a whole story in them. The pomegranates, which I don't have the time to get into today to tell you about those decorations on the two pillars. But God says, he that overcomes, I will make a pillar. Wow. And we know that in Proverbs, it talks about the seven pillars and the revelation of the wisdom of, the, of, of understanding what, what the, the meanings of that is. And we understand how that even David, when he was a successful uh, warrior, being used of God, he understood that his victories was not of his own strength and his own mentality. And he writes in Psalms 144.1, Bless the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands to war my fingers to battle. Now let's read it again. Bless the Lord my rock, who trains my hands to war, and my fingers to battle. Wow. Don't say that this book of the wars is not important. It is important. It is absolutely essential to understand. And it's one of those incredible oracles that's been hidden it's another part of the invisible Bible. It is meant for us to know and to understand it. it. It is meant for us to come into its total understanding. The Bible says in Luke 24, 27, and 44 and 45, that beginning at Moses, Jesus began to explain from Moses on all the prophets. And he expounded the scriptures to show that in those books which those people thought was only about Moses and only about po uh, the prophets as they prophesied about Israel and other nations, he began to expose that and teach them and expound to them that these scriptures revealed Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Wow. 
Wow. It's exciting. It's very, very, very exciting. This root and the offspring, this duality, this duality of the two angels on the Ark of the Covenant, duality of the two angels with the swords of, uh, and flames of fire, and how that when we look up the word rod, we find that the rod can be a staff, can be a pole, can be all kinds of other things, including even being a sword. Wow. We know that there's a lot of things not understood. And scientists, they have a hard time bringing the compliments and the, the intricacy of the Bible into anything that is scientific because the scientific realm basically is involved with physical revelation or physical expounding of literal things. And the term spirit is thought to be out of the out of the science realm of concepts. But is it? What about such things as ghost and virtual reality, abstract, imaginative math? Wow. There's been a loss of meanings, and the word spirit is one of those meanings. We talked about the sum of the scriptures. In the spiritual mathematics that I have done, I show a plus and a zero and a minus sign equals the spirit. Plus, a zero, and a minus sign, sign equals spirit. In quota math, they show a zero equals a plus and a one. And if you really look at that, at these two different signs, which are nevertheless written differently, but nevertheless at the end, there is a relevance. So in this quota math, which is dealing with these minute things that are invisible, they are in a way describing the spirit world under a different name. Not every particle am I referring to that, but there's other aspects. And given time, we will get into it. In Strong's Hebrew 4294, it describes the rod. It can be a twig. It can be a, a staff. It can be a scepter. It can be a, a stick, a branch, a scion, a scion, a dart. It can even represent a tribe. What did I tell you about all these different words that you can bring forth out of these 500 roots? One of the greatest, most powerful person on the dark side, Nimrod, R-O-D. And his father, Cush, who also was named Baal, B-A-A-L, and B-A-E-L, and Bel, B-E-L. Hey, we're just opening up this revelation. We're just beginning, and this is my introduction. Next week, wow, we're going to jump into the breakers, and we're going to calm them down and bring them into land and show the people the truth, the reality, the beauty. Those things hidden since the beginning of the world. Those things covered up. Those things that Satan does not want you to know. May God bless you. May his spirit rest upon you as we get into this series of the lost book of the wars of the Lord or the gods. And may this be an entry for you into the temple of God in a way 
of sanctity that you have never experienced before. And you that are out there that need healing, may God, may God's face shine on you and light you up inside and heal your evermost being. God bless you. We love you. Until next week.